Do you have Barrett's esophagus and want information about its treatment? Then check out this video to learn about the medications and procedures we use to treat Barrett's esophagus. First, all patients who have Barrett's esophagus should be on a proton pump inhibitor, a PPI. Data has shown that people who use a PPI indefinitely, like omeprazole, will have a lower rate of progression to dysplasia and cancer, and that is great news. Further, people with Barrett's esophagus very often have symptomatic GERD, and so it helps to control their symptoms for them to be on a PPI. Omeprazole 20 milligrams is often sufficient, but if they have constant symptoms or their esophagus remains inflamed, then this is a reason to escalate the therapy. Some data suggests that a PPI may even help Barrett's to regress, but ultimately, Barrett's esophagus is seen as a chronic condition. And so, like taking a baby aspirin for heart disease, being on the lowest dose that you need to help control symptoms is the best course. If PPIs fail to control your symptoms, or you have persistent inflammation of the esophagus despite maximum therapy, then a consideration is to have an anti-reflux surgery, which we discuss in a separate video. The recommended timeline to monitor Barrett's esophagus is based on its severity. If you have a short segment, one or two centimeters, then five-year interval is a sufficient amount of time to wait until a second look. If you have three or more centimeters, a long segment of Barrett's, then you need to be following up closer within three years. If there's a concerning finding like dysplasia, then we're gonna to wanna to see you back within a year. And if there's really severe inflammation, then that can confuse the picture of Barrett's. And so we want you to be on a high dose of PPI to help simmer down that inflammation and then have a second look within a couple of months. These upper endoscopies help us to look to see if there's any abnormalities that are developing out of that Barrett's esophagus. We wanna see if there's concerning patches of irregular tissue or if there's nodules. And we then wanna take biopsies at regular intervals and we're building out a roadmap by doing this. So if there are concerning findings, we can go back and know where they need to be treated. When an area of concern is found within Barrett's esophagus, the next step is to remove that area and to eradicate all the Barrett's esophagus. Now this begs a question, why don't we just start off by eradicating Barrett's esophagus? The reason is, is that these treatments can be painful and they have some risk. And so if we were to just treat everyone with Barrett's esophagus as if they had high risk lesions with some aggressive endoscopic therapies, we'd be causing undue pain and taking undue risk that would really not be very beneficial because the fact remains that most Barrett's esophagus does not actually progress towards dysplasia or cancer. And so again, the best course of action is the conservative one, and we're gonna follow this by taking close looks at the Barrett's esophagus. As long as it looks good, then we'll just continue to monitor it carefully. We reserve treatment with endoscopic techniques when there are these concerning findings. So when we embark upon endoscopic therapy, the first order of business is to remove any nodular growths. This may be done during a dedicated endoscopic procedure because one of the big questions is gonna be, can we remove the entire nodule? We use techniques similar to what we would use during a colonoscopy to remove a polyp. And once we get those irregular growths out, they're gonna be viewed under a microscope. If they have a clean cut that shows no deeper invasion, then we're good to proceed with further endoscopic therapy. But if under the microscope, we find that there's irregularities penetrating deeper into the esophagus, then this is a signal that we need to stop and consider surgery. Once we know that we're in the clear of any dysplastic or nodular growths being clean cuts, then we can proceed with eradicating the Barrett's esophagus, which we do with a couple of different techniques. Some use heat, some use cold to either fry or freeze the Barrett's esophagus and get it back to normal esophageal tissue. A preferred technique uses a paddle-like device to deliver radio frequency waves. And these are very short, and so their energy is concentrated within the shallow depths of the esophagus and that's gonna burn the surface layer of the Barrett's esophagus without injuring any deeper levels of tissue. Some patients may not respond to this technique of radiofrequency ablation, or their esophagus may be riddled with tight turns or narrowed areas that don't allow us to properly place the paddle device in the appropriate position. In that case, it's helpful to use a non-contact method like cryoablation. This uses a deep freeze delivered through liquid nitrogen so that the affected areas of Barrett's esophagus are appropriately destroyed and eradicated. Studies have proven that both of these techniques are safe and effective, and so either can be used. And in some cases, they can even completely eradicate the Barrett's esophagus, return the esophagus to normal. However, the Barrett's esophagus can return, and so it remains important to have future looks at the esophagus to ensure that it remains healthy. 
I hope that this information has been helpful to you, and there's a lot more to learn about GERD and its complications, including Barrett's esophagus. So please subscribe to the channel and keep watching. Thank you and be safe.